which is on his version five. So uh, thank you very much, Luca, for being here. And um, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marco. Um, and yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. And hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Luca. Uh, and today I will be talking about the Open Vision computer and specifically the fifth iteration. Uh, so the Open Vision computer is a project that has been going on for quite some time. As you can see, like I included for for sake of, uh, for like to, yeah, I've included like, you know, the, the list of people who worked on this over the years. Um, and so like we, we are currently on the, in the iteration five, so we'll give a, a brief overview of what the platform is and like the history before getting a bit, uh, a bit deeper into, into the current version. So what's the, what's the motivation? Like, why did we build, first of all, the, an, an open source vision system, computer vision system? So the idea is that, um, uh, like some, we, how to say it? Uh, like sometimes uh, off the shelf vision systems are great because like, you know, for example, let's say all you want, all you want is like some stereo vision and you want like a very simple API to get some information out of the camera. And so in that case, you can just buy an off the shelf camera. Uh, but in some cases off the shelf doesn't work. Uh, and this is, this is for most cases where you want a very specific application where maybe, maybe you have like very, very uh, critical size, weight, and power constraints, or very critical like latency constraints or computational constraints, or even hardware constraints in, in case you want to integrate some specific hardware. So we embarked like a long time ago in this quest to create an open source, like from both a hardware, firmware, and software point of view, computer vision system. So the, the, the project has been going on for about seven years by now. And like the, those are like all the applications. So in the first five years, we have been focusing on the FLA program. So you can see like uh, over here, like one of our, one of our open vision computers uh, flying on a, on a drone. And this was in collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. So in this case, the, the constraint was uh, like having like good global shutter images and a very like small, uh, wait, let me, uh, and a very small and light uh, vision system. Uh, and while in the last two years, we, we moved into a, a different direction, which is looking into mobile manipulator sensor heads. So in this case, since we are working with a ground robot, we don't really have a, we're not really constrained in a sense of size or weight, but we, in this case, we just wanted to look into flexibility and having a and like expandability of the platform. So in the beginning, the, in the beginning, like, you know, the FLA era from OVC one to OVC three. So the, the purpose of the, of the FLA program is to fast lightweight autonomy. So to fly small and light drones quickly through clutter space and to do like autonomous navigation. So we, we went like through three iterations over here. The first two were very based on the NVIDIA TX2 platforms. So they were like FPGA platforms that you connect to the NVIDIA TX2. Uh, but then we, we decided that it's not great to be bound, uh, to be very specific to the NVIDIA TX2 platform because like NVIDIA could, for example, like release a new platform uh, suddenly with like a very different like hardware connection or like even software software support, uh, which, which did uh, happen over the years with, for example, the Xavier or the Jetson platforms. So we went into OVC three, which is uh, which is uh, what a change of direction, and is the direction that we have nowadays, uh, where OVC is at the end of the day just a USB device that you connect to your computer. Um, and then uh, most of the most of our OVC platforms are like FPGA based. So the idea is that, especially in the case of the FLA program, we want to offload as much computation as possible to 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 the camera. To, to help like downstream users of the uh, downstream users of the computer vision system to do whatever they need to do. So in this case, we are, we actually developed an open source and open uh, uh, feature detection algorithm running in FPGA that runs basically as pixels coming from the camera. This is running real time, so you have basically like zero latency, and you you run this uh, uh, this feature detector called AST detector. I won't go to to too far into it, but basically you look at a circle around the, uh, around every pixel and you try to look for, for corners. So what happens is that you, you have in real time, uh, you have output of images 
and features in that images that are very useful, for example, for uh, SLAM or like, you know, for localization and mapping uh, applications. And then since, since you have both these features, uh, you can also like use the images with some like more off the shelf algorithms, um, like for example, oh, wait, this just crashed. Uh, like for example, you can you can use them. You can use some like YOLO implementation to run like some some like uh, object detection or like uh, segmentation. Um, so so this this was like the typical application of like some computation in the PG and some computation in for example like with the NVIDIA platform. Um, so I won't go yeah like did this I won't go too much into detail but this was like you know the OVC one. And this, so where, where we have like, you know, synchronized, uh, synchronized cameras and like outputs, output of features. And this is an example of autonomous flight happening, uh, happening using our vision system with the, with the PGA. Like, you know, so, so they run like stereo matching on the GPU and then also run localization and mapping. And then you can like, you know, build map and do autonomous flight. And then, as I said, we moved into OVC3. So OVC3, the idea is that now we, are, we, are, we don't directly attach to any NVIDIA platform, but now we are just like a USB-C device. Uh, so any, like regardless of what machine people are running, they can just connect to our camera through USB. They can like, you know, get synchronized images and like do, then do whatever they want from, a, from their downstream point of view. Uh, and again, like, you know, this, this was used again, like with the Grasp Lab University of Pennsylvania to like, to do that. So, so this, this is an example of like data stream coming from our sensor, uh, where like, where like it's using the, it's, it's doing again, like localization and mapping based on the, based on the outputs of, of our cameras to like navigate autonomously in this very tricky environment because it's a forest. So there's a lot of repetition. There is a lot of, um, like it's, it's, it's not very easy to, to, to navigate around. Uh, and like, you know, they do tree detection to localize and to avoid trees and to build maps. Oh, la, la. Anyway, so after, after OVC3, we moved into this, this new era of OVC4. So again, like in this case, we are not really, uh, we are not really uh, constrained by size, weight and power as you would usually be on a flying platform because this is a ground vehicle. So right now the idea is to have a very flexible computer vision system where you can uh, connect whatever image sensor you want and you will just like integrate all of them. And then we also want to achieve a low, lat a low latency vision to, uh, because low, low latency is critical for like a fast acting robots and like for effective like control loops. So, so we, we are like this, these three targets, um, which were, uh, which were ease of use, uh, high bandwidth and low latency. So for ease of use, we decided to go for the Jetson, for the Jetson Xavier NX platform. And the idea is that um, G, like programming GPUs is a lot easier, easier than programming FPGAs because there is a lot of support out there for, for GPU algorithms. Uh, and it's also like a lot easier because it's, it's more like, you know, maybe you have like a C or C++ kind of language compared to hardware description language. Um, and then the Jetson, the Jetson platform also has MIPI input, so you can like feed camera data straight into the into the Jetson platform. So we developed this OVC4, which is a a, a custom like Xavier NX carrier board uh, with a with a high-end MCU microcontroller. So the microcontroller is used to for the hard real-time tasks, for example, sensor synchronization, uh, while the Xavier NX is used for to fetch images and maybe to run some computer vision algorithm and return them to the user space, to the user. And then again, we are also very interested in like high bandwidth. So uh, we looked into like 10 gigabit ethernet and we could go all the way to like, you know, 9.5 gigabits uh, per second of like effective bandwidth. Uh, but this, this, required, this required like a 10 gigabit ethernet port. Uh, and that's, that's something that is not very common. So we decided to, Again, like switch to something simpler and just do uh, like a single USB three connection where like that that you can plug into your machine, which gives us about one quarter of the bandwidth, like two point five gigabits. And the low latency sadly is the part where it just didn't go very well. So 
The problem is that specifically for the NVIDIA platform, you need to use their own proprietary API to fetch images from the sensors. And then you can't get away from, uh, from like the, the frame buffering that is happening. So what happens is actually every time uh, there, is, there is like a, a three to four frame buffer in the JSON. So every time you read a frame, you're actually reading a frame that was captured three frames in the past. So it's okay for if you have a very high, very high frame rate sensor, but since we were running like 15 hertz, this resulted in almost 300 milliseconds of latency, uh, which which was totally unacceptable. So we decided to like change uh, change approach. Uh, so we went for OVC five, which is a mix of a mix of the two, and which is a, like a FPGA based. So it's based on the Zinc platform from from Xilinx. And, it, um, and it's uh, also like a fully configurable platform. So we, we, we managed to about double the bandwidth and the, the approach is that right now we still do USB, uh, but uh, it's a double USB, double like five gigabit connection to an onboard USB hub, which then exposes a single like 10 gigabit connection to the user. So the user just needs to, to have a 10 gigabit uh, USB port connect one wire and then they, they will get like up to 6.5 to 7 gigabit per second uh, data from the from the from all the images that OVC file is running. And then for the for the latency it's um, it's even more interesting because now we have full control over what's happening because we have very low level hardware control. Uh, so we we can go all the way to not even have a full frame buffer but like send image while it's still coming from the sensors. So we managed in this way, we managed to reduce the latency by a factor of 10. So, so now the sensor to user space latency was about like, you know, 27 milliseconds. Um, and then again, like it's, it's a fully expandable platform. So we, we provide like six connectors and they follow the somewhat standard Raspberry Pi camera pinout. Um, so, so, so the idea is that users can like plug whatever configuration of camera they want. They can like synchronize them, integrate them, and output them over a single over a single USB connection. Um, so, what is what is the ar architecture like? So, I, I won't go too much into into detail, but basically, we're using this this Xilinx chip, uh, which is a which is puts together a multi-core processor. In this case, it's an ARM Cortex processor together with FPGA, together with a programmable logic with an FPGA. And the two are like very highly coupled. So you have like, you can have interrupts going between the two, or you, you have like a high speed interconnect to external memory to, for example, share the images. And the, the interesting part is that uh, Xilinx in general provides a, quite a lot of like open source uh, IPs, which are like, you know, boxes of VHDI code that do the most common uh, common operations you might want to do. So actually the, the interesting part is that thanks to all this free, not open source, but free free for use IPs provided, actually there is not a single line of VHDL or Verilog uh, that was written to, to have OVC5 up and running. So it's all pure uh, Linux, like C++ or Python work really. Um, so, okay, now, but like the question is like, you know, how does it actually work? Um, Again, I won't, I won't go too much into this. This is just to, to give um, to give a idea of like how, of like the complexity, um, oh la la. Uh, to, to give an idea of like, you know, the complexity of the, of the platform. So th there are a lot of like steps happening because again, this system on a chip is a very complex, uh, complex system. But, but again, like, you know, the, the, the tool chain takes care of most of the work for you. So you just, it's one of those cases where you don't really need to do a lot of work, but you need to know exactly where to where to go and do it. And do it. So, for example, what, what we we had like we had a, our own custom uh, FPGA logic, and then a, a tiny bit of customization on the Linux kernel um, kernel side, and the rest is just everything is done from a user space Debian. Uh, so you you don't need to have like too much knowledge of very low level hardware to to work in this. So how does it work? Um, a very high level idea is that we have, first of all, we have like, we can run up to six images in parallel. So every imager uh, uses an I2C interface to like configure it. 
uh, and then the, it, it outputs data through a MIPI interface. Uh, then, the, the, then the data like is re received and decoded, sent to like a DMA, so a block to write into into shared memory, and then the data will be write, written to external memory. And then the, the communication through the ARM processor happens through interrupts. So whenever a uh, a DMA finish writing a whole a whole frame, it will send an interrupt to the processor saying, "Okay, I finished a frame. Now you can read it and just read from this area of memory." But also for the for the low latency pipeline I mentioned before, you can just configure it to only receive a part of a frame and then notify the processor. Okay, I received half a frame. Now you can start sending data as fast as possible. Uh, and so so this this will be this is also like communicated to the processor. Mm. So again, like you know, a very high level overview of the software. So. Um, we do like full like uh, since we want a, like a very configurable uh, oh la la since since we want a very configurable platform we actually do detection at runtime of the images so based on every 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 sensor has maybe their own expert C address and they have, they have maybe a register with a very with a special value so we use this to to check at at, at boot time what con what sensors were connected. We initialize all of them and then we assign them to, since we have these two parallel USB connections, we assign them to the USB connection with the most available bandwidth. And then depending on what the user configured, we can either do a full frame buffer, which is a, a conventional loop where you wait for an image, you send the image, and then as soon as everything, all the images are done, you wait for images again. Uh, or you can do this very low latency application where you just wait for a certain number of lines from one specific imager and then you do this overlap receiving and transmitting for all the all the images that you have depending on whether you want ease of use or you want like extreme low latency so again like you know this these two different approaches so if you want extreme low latency again like you know you receive a few lines from an image and then you trigger all the images so this is great because you have the almost the lowest possible latency. So I would say like much lower than any uh, any commercial system could could have probably. Um, but then if you don't really know what you are doing, you risk receiving corrupted frames because you must be sure that uh, that you you are you that the, when you are sending data, you are send like you are sending the right data. Basically, you are not sending half a frame in the past, half a frame in the future. Um, while if you want a more conventional and simple application, you can just wait for a full image to be received and then you send it over. Um, and this is a lot more flexible because you don't need to know exactly how every sensor works because you, you just send all the data when you receive the full image. So you don't risk corrupting frames. Um, and then, but then again, it's, it's, a, it's a bit higher latency uh, because now you have a full frame, but then again, it's nothing compared to, for example, what the Xavier platform had, which was a three to four frame latency. So it's still reduced by a factor of three to four. Um, and again, I wanted to give a, a bit of an, an acknowledgement because like the, this, uh, this wouldn't be possible uh, if there the wasn't this, this uh, retired FPGA engineer, Japanese FPGA engineer that wrote this uh, this user this uh, kernel module to allow users to map data into user space, um, and it's it's uh, like you know this is a very relevant XKCD because it's the, the one person that has been thanklessly ma maintaining it this 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 single piece of code. And if you look at all the issues on GitHub, like a lot of people are really relying on what this this person has been doing in his free time. So if you're if you're there listening, thanks a lot. Absolutely. Um, and like you know, a bit, a bit of like just to show like what we've actually done with this platform. So uh, first of all, a, a, a bit a bit of introduction that um, the the imager the imager's hardware world is traditionally a very 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 closed source uh, closed source world. So we we work with a lot of different images. So we will the, first of all like the simplest one. Uh, oh, la, la. Uh, the simplest one is the Raspberry Pi camera that you see here on the left, the Pi camera V2, I believe it's called. And this is the, the one that we provide that are open source reference implementation because there are a lot of implementations for this camera. So we just 
uh, we took a mix of like different uh, we took a mix of like different configurations from different like GPL implementation, GPL slash BSD implementations, and then we, we put one together. And then we, we experimented with a lot of other sensors over here. So we experimented with uh, a, a two megapixel global shutter sensor, so which is very good for fast moving applications like drones. And then we like a five megapixel HDR sensor over here, which is good in cases for in cases you need HDR. So if you have a high dynamic range, so if you have like a very dark and a very bright part of the scene. And also the IMX 490, which is also like an even better HDR, HDR sensor designed for automotive applications. Um, but sadly again, because because the 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 sensor, the image sensor market is generally very conservative. All, all of this work here was done under NDA, so it cannot be shared, but we still provide a reference implementation for the open source Raspberry Pi camera that people can um, can reference for their own for their own sensor. Um, and then finally, uh, together with all the image sensor, we also looked at time of flight, um, which is um, time of flight is, is basically just a way to use a like you use a laser to calculate how far uh, objects are. So you shine a laser and then you do some calculations based on uh, the, how long it takes to the, for, the, for the lights to come back. Um, and uh, voila. And then this brings us to our final grand unified demo unit, uh, where we just integrated a bunch of all these different sensors together. We have two HDR, we have an HDR stereo pair, then we have three global shutter images pointing in three different directions. And we have a depth camera to do like time of flight uh, pointing forward. And then we have all of them, you know, all of them like synchronize, they work at the same time, like they, they capture synchronized images, they send them to the user space. So the idea is that then users have like this, this full set of synchronized images and they can like from a bunch of arbitrary sensors and they can like do whatever, whatever they want with them. Uh, yes, and this is me from my desk like showing, yeah. Doing, doing an example of this. So we have like the two HDR sensors, the time of flight sensor and the three global shutter sensor. So you can see how, for example, like global shutters have some problem when there's a lot of like bright and dark in the image, but it's not really an issue for like HDR sensor. So the, the idea of the heterogeneous set of sensors. So yeah, uh, lessons learned is that, yeah, again, like in every application has very different, uh, has very different needs. So it's, it's good to have, to have flexibility to like be able to, plug whatever sensor configuration you have and like do whatever you want with the images. And also you need to have like full control of the, of the data flow to have low latency. And again, like, you know, these days fabrication is probably most of hardware people know is very hard. So it's like um, the, the lead time is actually making it like very hard to like keep developing on this platform at least for the past one or two years. So yeah, we are, we are looking in the future for like, you know, uh, since we, since, we, since we have hardware control of all the pixels, we are looking at um, for uh, like having hardware-based uh, privacy. So for example, for like, you know, camera detection or like people detection uh, or like pedestrian detection and so on. So like to, to make sure that since it's a fully open source platform uh, and like everyone knows what's happening at every point, then it's like a fully guarantee to like ensure the privacy of the, of the people that are captured by the camera. Um, so yeah, if you want to have a look, you can go to the link over here, Open Vision Computer, and yeah, there it is. Thank you, thanks all of you. This is the iProfit there.